撃し大撃しそれぞれ結果の様を抱き上空に変態を収め The soldier reading these pages would do well to reflect on the wisdom of the statement exhibited in a Japanese shrine. Woe unto him who has not tasted defeat. Defeat brings into sharp focus the causes that led to failure and provides a fruitful field of study for those soldiers and laymen who seek in the past lessons for the future. Orlando Ward, Chief of Military History, 1952. Mere hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces attacked the U.S. Commonwealth of the Philippines. As part of its Pacific wide plan to seize much needed resources and Manila's strategically important harbor. Over the next five months, American and Filipino forces would conduct a stalwart defense of the islands that would cost many lives and end in defeat while disrupting Japan's plan for conquest in the region. By 7 December 1941, the Philippines, a chain of 7,000 islands in the Pacific, had been a U.S. territory for over 40 years. Located over 11,000 kilometers from San Francisco, but just under 3,000 kilometers from Tokyo, it was America's first line of defense against the threat of Japanese expansionism in the Pacific. With Japan already in control of the island of Formosa to the north, the Marshall, Caroline, and Gilbert Islands to the east, And occupying a significant part of China to the northwest, the U.S. military garrison in the Philippines was all that prevented Japan from consolidating its gains and driving south to seize the Dutch East Indies' valuable resources of oil and rubber. The American military, however, had concerns about the feasibility of defending the Philippines. As early as 1914, then Second Lieutenant George C. Marshall was able to demonstrate. During maneuvers simulating a Japanese invasion of Luzon, how easily the capital city of Manila and its major port could fall to aggressors. With the coastline longer than the United States, the military appreciated just how difficult it would be to defend the Philippines effectively. Various changes in U.S. policy also undermined the defense of the Philippines. These included the Washington Naval Treaty, signed in 1922, which halted U.S. construction of new fortifications in the Pacific. In exchange for Japan limiting the size of its fleet. With only one reinforced stronghold set at the mouth of Manila Bay on the island of Corregidor, the Philippines' defenses were questionable. The Navy expects to solve the naval defense problems that may confront the United States in the Navy's traditional way without alliances. It expects to stand on its own feet. In providing protection to the United States, this realization was evident in the Joint Army and Navy's basic war plan for the Philippines. Updated in the spring of 1941, War Plan Orange III prescribed a limited defense of the Philippines that focused primarily on denying an invader the use of Manila Bay. It also outlined a predetermined fallback plan for civilians and soldiers that acknowledged the difficulty of halting a Japanese invasion force. That U.S. intelligence estimated could reach 300,000 troops in a month's time, as the Japanese established a blockade against U.S. reinforcements and resupply. As such, the plan for the defense of the Philippines is best understood as a delay. If properly reinforced, it was hoped that the island's garrison could delay Japanese forces long enough for additional troops to arrive and partners to commit to the fight. A variation of a retrograde. A delay is when a force under pressure trades space for time by slowing down the enemy's momentum and inflicting maximum damage on enemy forces without becoming decisively engaged. In 1935, the U.S. Congress voted to make the Philippines a commonwealth with full autonomy. At the end of a 10-year transitional period, 
this change to self-governance shifted the responsibility for the defense of the islands to the Philippines government and its people. However, it complicated command and control and unity of effort between U.S. forces and the Philippine Army. In response, the Philippine National Assembly voted to stand up a force of 10,000 soldiers, supplemented by 400,000 reserve troops. At the request of President Manuel Quezon, Douglas MacArthur, recently retired from the U.S. Army, was asked to oversee the creation of the Philippine Army as Field Marshal and military advisor to the Commonwealth Government of the Philippines. From the start, MacArthur faced serious difficulties in training and preparing the Filipino forces for the future. With some 65 languages spoken among them, Filipino troops were often unable to effectively communicate among themselves or with their leaders. Additionally, the absence of schools for commissioned and non-commissioned officers was a serious obstacle to standardizing tactics, techniques, and procedures across the highly diverse force. Severe shortages of weapons, uniforms, and housing also hampered the Philippine Army's training and preparation. Such handicaps were magnified by the lack of military vehicles and permanent roads for transporting soldiers, a feature particularly ominous for forces tasked with conducting a delay where maintaining a mobility advantage over the attacking force is a necessary prerequisite for success. These handicaps were complicated by a military communication infrastructure that relied heavily on unreliable civilian telephone and telegraph systems. The Philippine Army, however, was not the only military unit training on Luzon prior to the Japanese attack. In 1941, the U.S. Army's Philippine Department, under the command of Major General George Grunert, was headquartered out of Fort William McKinley with over 22,000 soldiers. Its largest unit, the Philippine Division, was commanded by Major General Jonathan M. Wainwright and led by American officers. Though these two forces were originally intended to operate independently, the U.S. forces under Grunert and the Philippine Army under MacArthur began combined training exercises in July 1941 as war with Japan appeared more likely. Japan a member of the Axis Alliance had moved military units into French Indochina and assumed protectorate status over the territory. For the two generals, this posturing indicated that the Japanese could be preparing for additional offensive operations in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. They say trouble always comes in threes. Take a good close look at this trio. Remember these faces. Remember them well. If you ever meet them, don't hesitate. Intelligence analysts assess adversary actions and the posture of their forces to determine their intent and identify indications that can be used to warn of a pending attack. Indications and warnings are tied to timelines that inform commanders of how long before an adversary is capable of attacking and which course of action they are likely to pursue. These timelines enable the planning and response framework to react in accordance with the severity of the indication and the estimated enemy course of action. Commanders can then execute measures to deter the enemy from continued hostile acts while posturing friendly forces to respond if deterrence fails. The occupation of French Indochina triggered a response from the United States designed to ward off further aggression by the Japanese. After placing a freeze on all U.S.-based Japanese assets, President Franklin Roosevelt then halted shipments of rubber, iron and fuel to Japan and began planning for the military reinforcement of the Philippines. President Roosevelt's actions, designed to deter further Japanese aggression in the region, are examples of Flexible Deterrent Options, or FDOs. FDOs are established to deter actions before or during a crisis and may be used to prepare for future operations. They are developed and executed using each instrument of national power, diplomatic, informational, military and economic, but are most effective when used in concert. FDOs provide options for decision makers during emerging crises to allow for gradual increases in pressure to avoid unintentionally provoking full-scale combat, while simultaneously enabling leaders to develop the situation and gain a better understanding of an adversary's capabilities and intentions. Already reeling under trade restrictions imposed the previous year, this action pushed Japanese military leadership into a corner. Lacking the necessary materials to continue their plans for conquest, they made the decision to go to war by December 1941 if negotiations failed to reverse U.S. sanctions.
Sensing the coming conflict, President Roosevelt moved to defend the Philippines by combining the territorial Philippine Army with the U.S. Army units already stationed there. He then placed MacArthur in command of the newly combined force, designated as United States Army Forces Far East, or USAFI, and charged him with defending the islands. MacArthur was also recalled to active duty in the U.S. Army and was soon promoted to the rank of general. Earlier that spring, War Plan Orange III had been included as part of the national war plan known as Rainbow Five. The national plan was based on a recently signed agreement between the United States and Great Britain. This gave priority for supply and support to the war in Europe over all other areas of conflict. Establishing a timetable for completion by April 1942, the General's plan called for a reinforced defense that incorporated the island's natural terrain features to stop and repulse attacking forces on the beaches, while relying heavily on U.S. Army air power to actively attrit the enemy. By building his defense around the terrain and natural obstacles present on the island, General MacArthur illustrated a central tenet of defensive operations. According to Army doctrine, the commander always takes advantage of the terrain when planning how to position forces and conduct operations. The terrain dictates where a delaying force can orient on a moving enemy force and ambush it. A commander conducting operations in compartmentalized terrain selects locations that restrict the enemy's movement and prevent the enemy force from fully exploiting its combat superiority. Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall was personally familiar with the Philippines and after reviewing MacArthur's plan, authorized immediate transportation of the essential supplies and reinforcements that he had requested. To reinforce the Philippines, Army leadership deployed several National Guard units. The 200th Coastal Artillery Regiment and the 192nd and 194th Tank Battalions equipped with M3 Stuart tanks. MacArthur also received reinforcements for his air arm to include P-40 Warhawk fighter planes and B-17 Flying Fortress bombers. However, shortages in shipping space meant that some items were delayed or did not arrive. In one instance, air crews arrived in Manila ahead of their aircraft just before the start of hostilities in December. Since delivery of their A-24 Banshee dive bombers never occurred, these airmen spent the rest of the war fighting as infantry. To compensate for his lack of updated equipment and well-trained personnel, MacArthur's plan relied heavily on close integration with the Filipino forces. Recalling all 10 divisions of the Philippine Army from reserve for training and refitting, he task organized them into five distinct forces. The North Luzon Force, under the command of Major General Wainwright, defended strategically important areas of Luzon. These included the only beaches wide enough and deep enough to accommodate a large-scale amphibious landing. The North Luzon Force also had responsibility for the Bataan Peninsula, War Plan Orange's designated fallback area should the Japanese invasion prove unstoppable. Organizationally, the North Luzon Forces consisted of the horse-mounted 26th Cavalry Regiment and the 1st Battalion, 45th Infantry, both of which were fully equipped and extensively trained Philippine scouts. These units were accompanied by two batteries of 155 millimeter artillery and one battery of 2.95 inch mountain guns. Three Philippine Army Infantry Divisions, the 11th, 21st, and the 31st, completed Wainwright's command. MacArthur planned to support the North Luzon Force with the Philippine 71st Infantry Division, held in reserve at Manila. This division could only be released with MacArthur's permission. Following the war, Wainwright recalled the situation when he took over command of the North Luzon Force. Let me give you an example of the training status of the Philippine Army's divisions on the eve of the attack. Infantrymen trained on an average of three to four weeks before being forced to fight. Engineers got no training at all. Artillery never fired a practice shot. Indeed, its first shot was aimed in the general direction of the approaching enemy. Infantry had no combat practice, no combat training, and little or no rifle or machine gun practice. The divisions did not have a full complement of artillery. There was no means of transportation for any artillery. We got practically no transportation for any purpose. The divisions were badly undermanned. They were all short of ammunition. 
we were terribly short of hand grenades, 50 caliber machine gun, and infantry mortar ammunition. My command was spread over an area 75 miles from north to south and 100 miles from east to west. But the only means of communication with the various divisions was through the public telephone lines. The South Luzon Force, commanded by Brigadier General George M. Parker, Jr., was responsible for defending a zone covering the capital of Manila all the way south to the tip of Luzon. His forces were comprised of two Philippine Army Infantry Divisions, the 41st and 51st, that found themselves in the same training and equipment shortage situation as the North Luzon Force. They were supplemented by a battery from the 86th Field Artillery of the Philippine Scouts. MacArthur's Third Force was organized to defend the Bisayan Mindanao Islands area. It fell under the command of Brigadier General William F. Sharp and included three Philippine Army Infantry Divisions, the 61st, 81st, and 101st. The Harbor Defense Force, under the command of Major General George F. Moore, was MacArthur's Fourth Force and was comprised of four regiments of coastal artillery and one regiment of air defense artillery. The fifth and final force, located north of Manila, was the reserve force under MacArthur's direct command. Along with USAPI headquarters, the reserve's operational forces consisted of the Philippine 91st Division and the U.S. Philippine Division consisting of three infantry regiments and the Division Artillery, or Duvarti. It also included the 1st Provisional Tank Group consisting of two tank battalions. Rounding out General MacArthur's command was the Far East Air Force, commanded by Major General Lewis H. Brereton, which, in December of 1941, was the largest concentration of Army Air Corps aircraft outside of the continental United States. Logistical support, including food, ammunition, weapons, and medical supplies, were transferred from depots on Bataan and the island of Corregidor and distributed to each defending force. This was done to support MacArthur's desire to defend as far forward as possible. The 16th Naval District, under the command of Rear Admiral Francis W. Rockwell, was also a vital part of the Defense Force. With installation at Cabiti, Olangapo, and Corregidor, it included cruisers, destroyers, submarines, patrol boats, and the 4th Marine Regiment. Though under orders to assist in the defense of the Philippines, it remained independent of USAFI and instead reported to the U.S. Asiatic Fleet headquartered in Manila under the command of Admiral Thomas C. Hart. A testament to the early growing pains associated with creating a joint force, this lack of a unified command was not unique to the Philippines and plagued U.S. operations throughout much of the Pacific Campaign. For MacArthur and Rockwell, it upset unity of effort and further complicated their defense of the island. Running low on resources in the summer of 1941, the Japanese prioritized the seizing of the Dutch East Indies and the Malay Peninsula ahead of all other goals. We were in their way. We had to be removed, but in the Japanese way. To do this, they understood that the U.S. naval forces stationed at Pearl Harbor needed to be neutralized and that the threat from U.S. naval and air power in the Philippines had to be addressed. Deciding on his final attack plans in mid-November, Japanese Imperial General Headquarters assigned Lieutenant General Masuharu Homa and his 14th Army to conquer the Philippines. Lieutenant General Homa's army was made up of the 16th and 48th Infantry Divisions, augmented with additional armor regiments and mountain artillery brigades. Although they were called regiments, Japanese armor regiments were equivalent to American armor battalions, and Japanese tanks were of poor quality, their medium tank being smaller than the American Stuart light tank. The Japanese invasion of the Philippines was planned down to the hour, and by integrating land, sea, and air power, they quickly overwhelmed U.S. and Filipino forces, establishing several key lodgments. Japanese plans called for the complete destruction of the Far East Air Force and the seizure of several key airfields throughout the island chain. This would give the Japanese air superiority, enabling homeless divisions to attack without being harassed from the air. To do this, Japanese infantry would seize the key airfield on Bataan Island, north of Luzon, while fighters and bombers stationed on Formosa would attack airfields on Luzon. 
Japanese infantry would then continue to other fields at Apari, Vigan, and Legaspi, further south, culminating with the seizure of the airfield at Dabao on the large island of Mindanao, south of Luzon. With air superiority established and several airfields secured, the 14th Army would be free to begin its main landings on Luzon. The 14th Army's main effort would then come ashore at Lingayen Gulf, some 200 kilometers north of Manila, and begin attacking towards the capital. A smaller force would land at Lamon Bay, 120 kilometers south of Manila, and proceed north to link up with the larger force in a combined assault on the city. After capturing the capital, the Japanese could then seize Manila Bay and defeat any remaining U.S. and Philippine forces on Luzon, placing them in firm control of the largest and most important island in the Philippines. The attack on Pearl Harbor signaled the start of the invasion of the Philippines. U.S. Asiatic Fleet headquarters in Manila was the first to be notified at 0230 hours local time on 8 December. General MacArthur, however, was not notified of the event until an hour later when his chief of staff heard the news over the radio. MacArthur immediately put his troops on alert. Attacked four months earlier than intelligence estimates predicted, MacArthur had only a fraction of the necessary equipment and supplies he needed to defend the Philippines. As the Japanese began their invasion, the majority of MacArthur's soldiers and in particular, the Philippine Army troops lacked even the most basic necessities, from boots and helmets to serviceable rifles and ammunition. More importantly, they lacked the training necessary to fight as units in the field. In contrast, the Japanese forces were better trained and well equipped, with units having prior battlefield experience obtained during the ongoing Sino-Japanese War. Concerned that his airfields and aircraft might suffer the same fate as those in Hawaii, Major General Brereton requested permission for his B-17s to begin bombing the Japanese airfield on Formosa. However, due to delays and miscommunication between Brereton and MacArthur's staff, Brereton's fighters and bombers did not mount an attack against Formosa. Instead, Japanese fighters and bombers, based only 800 kilometers away on Formosa, arrived over Clark and Eba airfields. With little opposition from antiquated anti-aircraft guns, the enemy attacked both facilities, destroying their radar equipment and strafing or bombing the aircraft that had been holding for permission to attack the Japanese. According to plan, Japanese infantry landed unopposed on Bataan Island that same morning. They then proceeded to seize and secure the U.S. airfield located there and to establish a base for their short-range fighters. More importantly, the destruction of over half of Army Air Force assets at Clark and Eba airfields established Japanese air superiority over the Philippines on the first day of the war. The next day, 9 December, Japanese bombers from Formosa struck Nichols Field, destroying more aircraft and seriously damaging the installation. Opposition was light. Understanding that his ships could not expect protection from aerial attack, Admiral Hart dispatched the majority of his fleet south to Australia. Following their departure, the Japanese attacked the naval facilities at Kabiti on 10 December. As Kabiti burned, Japanese infantry supported by naval aircraft and gunfire from the Japanese fleet, landed on Kamigen Island, north of Luzon. The few U.S. aircraft left operational attacked units of the 2nd Formosa Regiment as it came ashore at Vigan and Apari, sinking one Japanese minesweeper and damaging four other vessels. Comprised of 3rd Battalion and half of the 1st Battalion's 2nd Formosa Regiment, the 2,000-strong Kano Detachment came ashore at Vigan. Another similarly sized force, known as the Tanaka Detachment, comprised of the 2nd Battalion and the other half of 1st Battalion's 2nd Formosa Regiment, attacked at Apari. These multiple landings were supported by two heavy cruisers, two destroyers, and defensive counter-air provided by fighter aircraft from Bataan Island. Over the next few days, the two detachments broke out from their initial lodgements at Apari and Vigan, and began moving south towards Manila 
along the coast on Route 3. On 12 December, 2,500 Japanese soldiers, known as the Kimura Detachment, came ashore approximately 500 kilometers southeast of Manila at Legazpi. General Parker, commander of the South Luzon Force, sent untried elements from the 41st and 51st Philippine Army Divisions to counterattack, but these were soon routed by the better trained Japanese. After successfully seizing its objective at Legazpi, the Kimura Detachment began its march north on Route 1 to link up with the forces landing at Lamon Bay for the advance on Manila. Keeping to Lieutenant General Homa's timetable for the taking of the Philippines, enemy landings until now had been minor incursions. However, on 22 December, Homa's main effort came ashore along the Lingayen Gulf. Comprised of the entire Japanese 48th Division with attached elements of the 16th Division, Homa's Lingayen force totaled just over 40,000 soldiers. Following a carefully timed plan that called for landings at three different locations, along a 24-kilometer stretch of the Gulf, the first wave of Japanese landing craft approached the beaches at 0500. Beginning in the south, units of the 47th Infantry Regiment and elements of the 48th Mountain Artillery landed at the village of Agu'u. Overcoming rough seas and weak resistance from unseasoned units of the 11th Philippine Infantry Division, the Japanese landed most of their forces with minimal loss. The middle landing was conducted by units of the 1st Formosa Infantry Regiment and elements of the 48th Mountain Artillery at the village of Arangay. The landings were virtually unopposed, and the 1st Formosa troops soon turned south on Route 3 to join their comrades of the 47th Infantry Regiment who had landed at Agu. The final landing, two hours later, by units of the Kamijima Detachment, composed primarily of the 9th Infantry Regiment, occurred further north at the village of Baowang. Moving ashore through rough waters, they briefly encountered stiff resistance from troops of the 12th Philippine Infantry Regiment before seizing the village. Breaking out from their lodgement, they dispatched patrols along Route 3 to make contact with Colonel Tanaka's detachment as it came south along the road. Advancing against light resistance, a unit of the Kamijima Detachment attacked along the Baowang Bagyu Road that ran to Rosario through the Cordillera Mountains and then seized the airfield at Nagilian. The enemy's success forced the 71st Philippine Regiment and elements of the 11th Philippine Division to withdraw. Meanwhile, the main body of the Kamajima Detachment seized the village of Baguio further east to prevent U.S. forces from outflanking the landing force and to act as a rear guard for the Japanese advance on Manila. As the enemy began its move inland, Wainwright's 21st Division defended the southern shores. This left the soldiers of the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts, led by Colonel Clinton A. Pierce, to defend against Japanese movements south along Route 3 from the village of Puzurobio. Advancing south along Route 3, Colonel Hifumi E. Mai's 1st Formosa Regiment and elements of the 48th Mountain Artillery received little opposition from the inexperienced and lightly armed 11th Division as they advanced towards the village of Da Mortis. Along the way, they linked up with the 48th Reconnaissance 9th Infantry Regiment and the 4th Tank Regiment. Both had come ashore earlier north of Darmartis. After advancing out of Agu'u, Colonel Isamu Yanagi's 47th Infantry and a battalion of the 48th Mountain Artillery faced weak resistance from a battalion of the 11th Infantry Division, which then retreated to Darmartis. Aware of the growing advance on Darmartis, General Wainwright ordered the 26th Cavalry to move from Puzurobio through Rosario and on to Damartis to aid in its defense. When the 26th Scout Car Platoon arrived at Damartis, they found the town unoccupied. The platoon then moved north on Route 3, where it made contact with the Japanese 48th Reconnaissance and 4th Tank Regiment. Unable to advance, the platoon returned to Damartis, where the 26th Cavalry was ordered to hold in a delaying action should a force withdrawal of the North Luzon force become necessary. At 1300, Japanese aircraft, armor, and infantry units began the attack on Damortis. In 
In response, Colonel Pierce asked for additional support from General Wainwright, who requested a company of tanks from Brigadier General James Weaver, the Provisional Tank Group Commander. Due to a fuel shortage, Weaver was only able to send a platoon of five tanks, all of which were either destroyed or damaged by 47mm anti-tank fire or the enemy's tanks. By 1600, additional Japanese units joined the battle, and by 1900, Damortis had fallen into Japanese hands. Ordered to withdraw, Colonel Pierce's cavalry paid a heavy price in lives and horses while performing successful delaying actions to protect the 11th Division's right flank. Attacked by the Japanese upon their arrival in Rosario, the 26th Cavalry Regiment was forced to withdraw again, this time further to the south, where they were ordered to hold the road junction between Rosario and Baguio until its defenses became untenable. By the morning of 23 December, elements of the 71st Division were in place along Route 3, south of Sison, preparing their defense while the 26th Cavalry passed south through their position on their way to Puzurobio. Although it may seem simple, a rearward passage of lines conducted under pressure from an attacking enemy is a difficult operation that requires close coordination and planning between the stationary and passing units to prevent fratricide. Rearward passage of lines are also important enabling operations for a delay or other retrograde, maintaining enemy contact while allowing for the recovery of security or other forward forces. While similar in planning and execution to a forward passage of lines, a rearward passage of lines is more difficult as the enemy likely has the initiative and the rearward passing soldiers are often fatigued and disorganized from battle. Friendly forces may also be more difficult to recognize because the enemy may be intermixed with them. To mitigate these issues, the passing and stationary units co-locate their command posts and agree upon clearly defined, often restrictive, control measures. They identify a battle handover line to delineate the area that the stationary unit commander will assume control of once two-thirds of the passing force has crossed. They coordinate for fires and ensure the stationary force is capable of providing indirect fire support for the rearward passing force. Finally, if time is available, the units reconnoiter the contact points, passage points, lanes, and assembly areas the passing unit will use to pass through the stationary force. They also identify any obstacles and friendly battle positions in the AO. The rearward passage of lines begins when the passing unit links up with the guides from the stationary unit at the predetermined contact points. The guides then lead the passing force to the passage points and along the lanes through the stationary force. The order of march is typically sustainment units first, followed by the main command post, functional units, such as engineers, and finally combat units. If the enemy force continues to press its attack during the passage, the passing unit controls the battle while the stationary unit monitors the passage of lines until the battle handover occurs. Once the passing unit hands over control of the battle to the stationary unit, the stationary unit initiates and clears calls for all fires forward of its location. While the 26th Cavalry Regiment executed its rearward passage of lines, the 91st Division, recently attached to the North Luzon Force and held in reserve, sent the 91st Regimental Combat Team to reinforce the 71st Division by taking up a position just north of Puzurobio along the road. The first attack of the morning was made by the Japanese 47th Infantry Regiment against the 71st Division, whose artillery held up their advance until noon. Reinforced by the 48th Reconnaissance and 4th Tank Regiments, the Japanese directed close air support on their positions, forcing the 71st to fall back to a line in front of the town of Puzurobio, where they were to link up with the 91st Regimental Combat Team already in place. After a hasty meeting of the American commanders, the 26th Cavalry Regiment was then ordered to retire to Binanlonen and set up an outpost for the division to fall back through should it become necessary. The Japanese entered the town of Sison around 1900, while the 26th Cavalry Regiment moved south and the 91st Combat Team prepared their defense outside Puzurobio. Later that same night, the Japanese attacked the 91st and secured the town placing them in position to seize the critical bridges across the Agno River to the south. 
General Wainwright, recognizing the staggering pace of the Japanese advance, realized that MacArthur's plan to repulse the enemy on the Luzon beaches was no longer viable. Intending to strengthen his right flank long enough to prepare a counterattack, he requested permission from USAFI headquarters to direct his soldiers to withdraw behind the Agno River. With his request approved, and while preparing his plan of attack, he received a call from headquarters, notifying him that MacArthur had scrapped his defense plan and put the original war plan orange into effect. Wainwright later wrote in his memoirs, It was a bitter pill to swallow, for war plan orange number three meant the last ditch. The long ago planned desperation withdrawal to Bataan. That was not all. MacArthur, I learned, was about to leave Manila and take his headquarters to Corregidor. A soldier's world is where he is fighting. Mine was falling to pieces. Wainwright could not have known it at the time, but MacArthur's decision to revert to War Plan Orange and fall back to Bataan would upset Homa's timetable, enough that it would delay Japanese war plans across the entire South Pacific. Christmas Eve arrived with the landing of Japan's Lamon Bay Force, 322 kilometers to the south of the Lingayen Gulf, under the command of Lieutenant General Susumu Morioka. Coming ashore with 7,000 soldiers of the 16th Division at three different locations, they could not have picked a better moment to attack. Having been denied permission to move any artillery defending the western approach to Manila, the South Luzon Force was also in the process of repositioning its maneuver forces when the Japanese began landing. The first attack came at Malban, where elements of the 1st Regiment, Philippine 1st Regular Division, defended against the enemy by laying down effective enfilading fire. By 0830, the Japanese had seized Malban and forced the defenders to fall back eight kilometers to the west. There, they vigorously defended their position, delaying the enemy's further advance. Further south, at the town of Sion, the second landing force came ashore at 0700 and met with little resistance. The Japanese then divided their forces, advancing elements along the Manila Railroad toward Tayabas Bay, while other units moved south to link up with the Kimura Detachment, currently marching up Route 1 along Sumalong Bay. The third and main landing force came ashore south of Antimonan, where it engaged with Company A, 52nd Infantry Regiment, Philippine 51st Division. The Japanese seized the town at 1100. A Japanese reconnaissance unit, supported by light bombers, also advanced to seize the town of Malikbai. Sustained attacks by enemy aircraft forced the defenders to fall back from the village and set up defensive positions 6.4 kilometers to the west, near the town of Binihan. By the evening of the 24th, while still attempting to delay the enemy from advancing along Route 1 toward Pagbilao, the defenders were overwhelmed and fell back under cover of darkness. The day ended with MacArthur ordering General Parker, the South Luzon Force commander, to organize the Bataan Defense Force and prepare the peninsula's defenses. 24 December was a difficult day for the North Luzon Force as well. With the Japanese already advancing on the Agno River, the 26th Cavalry Regiment attempted to delay them north and west of Bin Alonan. Mounting a fierce defense, the 26th stopped the first attack made by the Imperial Japanese Army's 4th Tank Regiment. The tanks then swung to the west to bypass the 26th, but the cavalry counterattacked and the Japanese were once again unable to advance. The Japanese then sent up more tanks and the 2nd Formosa Regiment as reinforcements. This put the cavalry at serious risk but they were too deeply engaged to break contact. General Wainwright, who was in Ben Alonan when the heavy fighting began, ordered Colonel Pierce and his 26th Cavalry Regiment, now reduced to only 450 soldiers, to fight a delaying action while falling back southeast from the Agno River to Tayug. For more than four hours, the outnumbered cavalry delayed the enemy, until finally leaving Ben Alonan to the Japanese around 1530. By the end of Christmas Eve 1941, the Japanese Lingayen Gulf and Lamon Bay forces had both established their beachheads, secured their initial objectives, 
and were in positions to the north and south to advance on Manila and a strategically important harbor. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. We interrupt our previously scheduled program to bring you this important news bulletin. Japanese soldiers have seized control of the Philippines' capital city of Manila and are marching against our remaining forces dug in on Bataan. As a result, President Roosevelt has ordered General Douglas MacArthur to leave the territory immediately. Without the ability to send supplies and reinforcements or to rescue those soldiers remaining behind, they are now left to rely more than ever on their skills and courage to survive. people know how to work. The kind of people that idolize this American because he stands for everything we promised and are doing for the Philippines. 